Um, we are now about to start the final panel of this amazing two-week course, and it is a very important and very appropriate panel. So um, I will ask my colleague, uh, Mrs. Margarita Kalanira Paul, to introduce the panelists and introduce the topic. But I permit me just to say this, that um, I have in my career um, as a diplomat and is an analyst, um, I've worked with some of the most amazing uh, professional uh, women that I can imagine, and all three of them are sitting on this panel. Uh, and the fourth one will, will come online, um, um, and many, many others. Um, so I'm particularly pleased and thankful for all of them to, to come on. Um, and as someone who um, has worked in this field, I can tell you that um, the, the contribution of of women in this field are often overlooked uh, and uh, unappreciated. And we have seen um, the, the work of, of, we've had some of women on this, on this course that um, has certainly made a huge difference. I would even, as a, as a male would say, far, far more important than men. So I'd really like to thank you um, for making time available to participate in this and now ask Margarita to, uh, to lead the panel. Thank you. Thank you, John, for this um, incredible opportunity. Uh, my name is Margarita Kalinina Paul, and as John mentioned, I work at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies. And for the last past years, I was following um, issues related to gender representation uh, and gender balance. In, um, in the field of nuclear non-proliferation, nuclear security in particular, that's what uh, my area of expertise is. And um, I'm really um, grateful for this opportunity to uh, have this conversation with three um, prominent women uh, from uh, uh, Sweden, Mexico, and Nigeria who have uh, been contributing to this field. And uh, it would be interesting to hear their views uh, about uh, how we could change the discourse or uh, also, as John said, maybe uh, there are women already in the field, how to amplify their voices, how to increase their visibility. And uh, I also want to uh, make a disclaimer that it's not about, uh, you know, us versus them. It's not about men versus women. It's uh, basically gender. When we talk about gender, we discuss um, uh, equal opportunities, inclusiveness, and diversity. And I think that that is very important, whether you are at a national um, uh, delegation at the NPT Review Conference, a nuclear power plant at university, men and women have to have equal opportunities. And I think that's uh, becoming a very um, uh, active uh, debate. And uh, hopefully we'll continue this debate here at this, uh, at this school. And, um, there are several reports which um, contributed in this discussion, and I will send a link to these reports uh, through the chat so every participant could uh, have a look at it. And they um, are, are promoting peace, uh, uh, viewing peace through a gender lens. Actually, it's a podcast, uh, which was done by our colleague, Sarah Bidgood, who cannot be on this panel today. Uh, there is another report produced by the Nuclear Threat Initiative uh, together with the Plowshares Fund, uh, which is called Gender Champions in Nuclear Policy Impact. It's a very uh, interesting uh, report which talks about uh, the impact uh, uh, that gender champions bring to the field of uh, non-proliferation disarmament. And there is also um, an interesting report which was done by the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research and uh, NOMS, uh, um, whom you've met uh, through the school, she participated in uh, this report. Uh, and that report was for Africa, uh, and uh, it, it's called Gender Perspectives in Arms Control and Disarmament, a view from Africa. Uh, UNIDIR was going to um, conduct a similar report for Latin America, but it, I think it was canceled due to the uh, pandemic. So I hope it will happen in the future. Uh, so, and uh, finally, um, without further ado, I would like to give a floor to our first speaker, uh, Ambassador Annika Thunberg, uh, who is the uh, Ambassador of Sweden to Mexico. Your Excellency, please uh, take the floor. Thanks a lot, Margarita. Uh, I seem to have pro some problems with my internet connection this morning, but I 
do hope that uh, uh, you all can uh, hear me. Uh, Good morning, everyone. It's great. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you all once again. I hope you have had uh, two weeks of uh, um, good education, a good course. Uh, and uh, Sean already introduced me last week, so I will immediately address the topic of this panel, but in a more general way, uh, which is my privilege. Let me start by saying that I come from one of the most equal countries in the world. We rank fourth in the latest international ranking. We don't still have uh, issues uh, um, that we need to focus on. We haven't, for example, achieved parity in the business sector. And uh, violence against women is an issue that re-emerges uh, with the um, crisis and with the uh, new types of macho cultures among the young in different subcultures, etc. I also would like to say that the high level of gender equality that we have achieved in Sweden is relatively new. I belong to a generation that has experienced the changes firsthand and over the decades. When, when I was a child in the 1970s, uh, Sweden was still a macho society, a sociedad machista, and a, a patriarchy, a patriarchal society. There were few women in parliament, few women in government. My father worked all the time, and my mother was a housewife with the main responsibility of raising me and my sister. But over time, this changed uh, due to a combination of political leadership, the role of the women's movements, legal changes and reforms and institution building, for example, shared paternity leave, separation of income taxation within a couple, daycare for all, for all children. And what I believe made the biggest change, the leadership of men in positions of power, men who stayed at home with their children while their wives were working, men who started to take the same responsibility for the home as their spouses did, thus allowing for equal opportunities in the workplace. This also helped change the discourse on what it meant to be a man, a discussion about new masculinities, that a macho culture is a prison also for men. It prevents them from choosing freely, both professionally and privately. And as, uh, as a result of this change of perspective, a man could thus choose to become a nurse or a teacher and a father actively involved in his children's lives, as well as a woman could join any profession, including in the armed forces, which the law in Sweden permitted in 1983. Or as a pastor in the church, uh, Sweden got its first female bishop in 1997, and today our archbishop is a woman. This story, I believe, is of relevance not only for the discourse in any field, including on proliferation, disarmament, and nuclear energy, but for actual change, because the more parity we have in any profession, the more each profession or professional field will reflect society as a whole, will be a democratic reflection of the diverse opinions and experiences that a population hold and has. And with a higher degree of representativity of democratic makeup, the more sustainable a reached agreement will be. Parity will also lead to a higher degree of creativity and innovation. We know from the business world that if all CEOs are white men of a certain socioeconomic background between 40 and 65 in blue suits, which I often have seen, we will not see much innovation and creativity in the business sector. And the same goes for the diplomatic core. If we in peace negotiations don't include a disarmament aspect, which is how do we get rid of the weapons? And if we in these negotiations don't include the people who have been affected by conflict, including the women who often have been taken care of the fields, the water supply, the agriculture, the domestic animals, while their male relatives have been drafted, the women who have been victims of other kinds of violence and that of armed battle, for example, sexual and domestic violence, anti-personnel mines that mainly affect, affect civilians. If they are not included in the negotiations, important perspectives experiences and stories will be missing from a treaty and the treaty will not be as sustainable or effective as it otherwise could have been. On the nuclear side, the stories of the victims, the humanitarian and environmental consequences have been of utmost importance of achieving the treaties we have achieved and the gender perspective will, yet, will add yet another dimension in future treaties. 
This perspective of democratic inclusion has been made very concrete in the feminist foreign policy that Sweden, as the first country in the world, adopted in October 2014. It governed very much the work we did as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council in 2017-18, where we made important progress in the area of women, peace and security, both in the resolutions and declarations issued by the Council and on the ground in peace negotiations in 12 countries, including Colombia, Afghanistan, Mali and Syria. Today, there exists an international network of female peace negotiator, uh, which is growing by the day. The feminist foreign policy is based on a simple concept. Women make up 50% of the world's population, but they still don't have or enjoy the same rights, the same representation or the same resources that the other half of the population does. The policy is uh, focused on achieving parity in every aspect of life through the three R's, rights, representation and resources, taking local conditions and contexts into account. It is not a project, but a perspective that is integrated in all our work. With greater parity, we as individuals and our societies don't any longer choose because of social constructs, but based on competence and ability. And a society can then better use all its potential. You will have the best person in the right place, regardless of gender. In disarmament and non-proliferation negotiations, we have traditionally seen more women outside the closed meeting rooms than inside them. And the Swedish delegation often being, uh, being an exception, we have had many women diplomats in this field, including heads of delegation since the 1960s. But on the other hand, the security policy, sort of the hard security policy, as it's often called, uh, was traditionally dominated by men in Sweden. But I think that with greater focus on gender equality, we probably, probably will see a more equal number of women, both as members of delegation and as members of civil society, as well as members of lobby groups, for example, the business sector. And this more democratic representation may also have a more positive effects on the results we will be able to achieve because they will be more of a democratic reflection and therefore um, more sustainable. I have been asked to end with a piece of advice to you as young diplomats. Uh, firstly, gender equality is not an issue only for women, but also for men. And not because you help women, as I often, uh, often hear, but for your own sake. Uh, you don't help your spouse in the house. You share the responsibility. Gender equality serves everyone well, men and women, families, organizations, uh, and organizations such as the Foreign Service included companies and society as a whole. This is uh, our firm uh, belief um, in my country. And to the women, I would like to say, pick good partners. Partners who believe that your career is as important as theirs, who are willing to share both professionally and privately with regards to the responsibilities at home and who want to be active and involved parents. And this is very important also for the children. Let me give you, uh, let, me, let, let me end by giving you an example. In the Swedish Foreign Service in the late 1990s, we had a state secretary, a vice minister, who chose to stay at home with his children when they were small, while his wife, who was a journalist, worked. Of course, our laws permitted that. This gave an incentive to all other male diplomats. If the vice minister, minister could do this, of course, they could do this as well. So among my male colleagues who are now in their 50s and ambassadors, I believe almost all of them have taken at least six months paternity leave with each one of their children while their wives have been working. And this has contributed very much to us today having a, I would say, completely equal diplomatic core at all levels in the foreign ministry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh Ambassador Tharberg, uh, that was a very um, great um, perspective that you shared. And what I took away from that is that, you know, a uh, greater focus on gender equality will allow us to see a more equal representation across all uh, spheres in the society, whether it's uh, the, uh, our field or business. And I think it's very important also that, uh, you know, gender equality, it's not for women only, it's for men. Uh, gender equality starts at home, basically. So that's what I think is very important. And um, I also uh, 
think that, that what you mentioned is very important that yes, some countries are more advanced in, um, you know, um, gender equality issues. And I think this is something that we could uh, use as uh, maybe um, success stories and uh, follow the uh, path which, for example, Sweden has taken and follow other countries' examples because it's, an, and it's also, I think, very important to share examples because we don't sometimes know, you know, what other countries are doing. And I think what you shared is very, very helpful. So um, thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is um, Ms. Paola Ramirez um, Valenzuela, who is the Deputy Director um, General for Disarmament, Non-Proliferation and Arms Control at, at the Secretariat for Foreign Affairs in Mexico. Please, uh, we are looking forward to your comments. Thank you very much, Margarita. Uh, and thank you very much, Annika, for your remarks. Actually, uh, they are really useful and I will not have to touch upon some <laughs> aspects now. So actually, I think I will base my presentation more in a personal um, experience. And per my personal experience and the experience of my uh, fellow female uh, colleagues, which I have met throughout my career. So I will, uh, I, I will comment on some of the challenges and opportunities that we have as women, uh, as diplomats first, and of course, particularly in the field of disarmament. So I will start with my first posting, which was San Diego in California, and I was in a consulate. And when I arrived, I actually have to be honest, I have no idea what my role was going to, I mean, what, what role I have to play there. Just arrived there and I was expecting to see, you know, which position I was going to take. And, and when they explain me, I just sit down and say, okay, don't panic, do your job, and that's it. But you notice something when you arrive to any position as a woman, and is that you have to prove yourself. When a man arrives to any posting, I like, oh yes, one arrive, eh, welcome, whatever. But when a woman arrives to any posting, it's like, okay, she's who? And uh, does she know how to speak English? Or, you know, like, you have really to prove yourself from zero. And that's something that I have faced, I think, in most of my postings. Not all of them, but most of them. And I think that my fellow colleagues have done the same. Um, the female one, the men one, even some of them arrive and they are really not that brilliant and it doesn't matter because they are men and they don't even have to, you know, uh, ask for uh, anything. They have the, the table is set for them when they arrive. So that's one of the challenges that we have to face uh, uh, even in the 21st century. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, one of the, of, the, of the roles that I had to play there was uh, to be a consul for protection of Mexican abroad, where you have to deal with uh, authorities, local authorities, such as uh, border control, uh, the ICE, uh, border patrol, all of them, which in a way is also a um, circle that is dominated by men. And the thing here is that Actually, you see, I mean, when, when they deal with a male consul, it's like, hey, bro, how are you? And it's more like, uh, it's easier for them to deal with a man. When you arrive as a woman, they actually do not know how to deal with you. And you have to set also the parameters about being professional, but also you can, I mean, you can be friendly uh, with a line, being careful also uh, of other kind of actions, which actually men do not have to take care of when they arrive to any position. So that will be just sharing some of the experiences and the challenges that we have to face. Uh, then, I mean, my second posting was in Ethiopia. And actually, I have to be honest, it was um, uh, the, the, the role that the ambassador that I have there play uh, was crucial to open the doors to me in order to have a status and a, a strong uh, professional status in the, in the community. This male ambassador was always taking me with him to every meeting. He was always presenting me as a deputy and giving me uh, the, the role that, that, that I have, giving me the position that I have. So I didn't need to prove myself at all. He was always giving me uh, respect and the position that I earned through my professional career. So, I mean, that's, that's a role that also um, we have to, to always recognize in male and women and the respect that we have to have uh, to each other is both ways also. Uh, 
then uh, I mean there uh, we have other I have other personal challenges let's say that way uh, Anika was mentioning this part of uh, be care I mean try to pick a good partner or or something like that not having a partner is also good I have to be honest and but sometimes when you have a, a partner there I mean I, I have I have the uh, I mean that that's that's a personal experience that I had there uh, I got involved with an uh, Arab diplomat I will not mention the country uh, and it was was quite challenging for me as a woman to 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 have the relationship not because of him but because of the role that people was expecting me to play out in his community and first of all it was uh, pretty challenging because they were telling me this country does not allow um, diplomats from that nationality to get married with other nationalities so they were always advising me you know, like, uh, you know, it's going to be a problem, security problem for him. You get involved with him. And these kind of things that you, I mean, you really don't believe that it's the 21st century, you know? So, I mean, it's kind of thing that we have to face uh, as women as well in, in this career. Who is going to be beside you and who is going to actually enrich your career, as, as Anika was mentioning. He was an amazing diplomat. Uh, and we enrich each other during our relationship a lot. We we had a strong professional also talks. We speak the, the same language. I didn't have to explain myself to him that I am a diplomat or not or whatever. Because here, I mean, if I if I tell any Mexican I'm a diplomat, they will look at me like, oh, okay, yeah, what's that? And and you know, it's it's actually kind of a barrier for someone to talk to you. And uh, okay, so that that's something that you have to to bear in mind uh, about female diplomats, and that's general female diplomats, not even disarmament diplomats. So, I mean, it's just start constructing uh, the, the context that we are living in. Uh, then I, uh, from there, uh, I, I have my, my, my finally, my, my position in Geneva as the expert for disarmament affairs. And I stayed there for six years. So I had a strong uh, uh, experience there. And I see diplomats come and go. I was one, let's say, of the veterans there when I left. So I see how also, the community change in, in, in Geneva for the last six years. But there, there are things that never change in this period and that we have to face. We have, as, as uh, Ambassador Bucaro mentioned, we have this group of, we call it the ladies, the servant ladies, which actually start just as a, you know, the few, really few women in the Conference on Disarmament meetings for, for literally pizza and, and drinks once every month and just try to talk of non uh, disarmament related issues because we need we needed to clear our, our heads and say we need to be normal human beings and stop talking of disarmament 24 7 because actually that's what happened when you when you actually get in the field and when we uh, start sharing some of the experiences as as, as delegates we came uh, to see some uh, really dangerous paths that we that still gets repeating. And I will mention a couple of them. Not all of them, of course, are mine. I will share experience of some of my friends without mentioning the names. So, of course, um, still that you can see some uh, sexual harassment. Uh, not that, sometimes it might be not that direct, but uh, I mean, I, I, I really remember one of my friends telling me, he doesn't know that my face is here. You know, he's always looking somewhere else. And I'm like, no, come on, he's, he's an ambassador. And he was like, look. So she went with him and just to say any kind of proposal. And I got shocked. I was like, what? The ambassador was just like looking like this. And I was like, what? what's going on? You know, and he never looked at her face, never. And it was, it was shocking because I didn't realize it, you know, and she was like, I'm really, really, uh, angry and concerned because actually that she was a really amazing diplomat and it, it didn't matter you know it didn't matter for for that ambassador that he was talking to a brilliant woman out there that actually was exposing something pretty interesting and have something to say it, it I mean she was a woman and that was that that was in a way something that was weakening her position so uh, that still happened and, 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 and it's something that we have to, to keep working on, to keep asking for respect and, and, and uh, is keep uh, uh, sharing these experiences until actually we have none or very few of them, uh, hopefully none. 
Uh, another one is, and, and that one uh, actually was uh, uh, to myself, it was something uh, we were dealing with the, with the negotiation of the treaty on the provision of nuclear weapons. And suddenly an ambassador of a country that do not support this treaty came to me and was really angry about the, 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 our national position. And then he started, uh, I don't know, to, to get out his frustration about the treaty. And uh, suddenly he looked at me and was like, so where is your ambassador? And I'm like, my ambassador is not here. My ambassador actually is abroad because he's in a, in a commission out there. No, 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 but I, 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 I need to tell him something on, is it something related to, how can I help you? And he was like, okay, no, because of the position of Mexico. He's like, yeah, if you want to talk to Mexico, you talk to me, you know? And, and that's something also that I learned because my ambassador also teach me to do that. It was my ambassador who said, whenever you are in a meeting, you are in Mexico and you are actually, if I'm not there, you are the one who, who they have to talk to. And later on, actually, he, he took it kind of, I think, uh, he was having fun with myself because he suddenly started putting me on the spot on really uh, difficult situations in the city and the negotiation of uh, final reports and these kind of things. And he was like, you know, you go and tell it yourself. You teach them. You have to go there and teach them that, that you are Mexico. It doesn't matter if you're a woman, it doesn't matter what, because actually I was getting personal um, attacks because of being a woman. And it was really obvious that was in the conference of disarmament. So, uh, I mean, this is, this is still today, we have to deal with it and realize uh, also uh, women that even if it's, this is not something that you will like, this is happening and you have, there's no time for whining, you have to face it. And we have to see the way in which this is gonna change. So we have also to contribute for, uh, for, for the future to see that other uh, colleagues are not facing this, uh, pushing each other uh, to the top, helping each other. And the, I think the, the most important characteristic that we have to develop is self-confidence. Uh, that's the only way that we can actually, I mean, show the value that we have uh, as, as professionals. So is, is, I, I think that that's something that, that, that I have to mention. Uh, also now, I mean, after, after Geneva, I came back to Mexico. I have to be honest, when I was in Geneva, when these topics of, of gender sometimes arises throughout negotiations, maybe of a resolution or something, sometimes it was, I, ha I mean, as a woman, it was annoying that I have a really difficult already resolu you know, resolution that was almost ready to, 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 to be table. And suddenly someone come and tell me, okay, could we add a paragraph on, on gender? And you get like, oh no, you know, this could damage the, you know, the, the, the negotiation of, the, of, of, of the, the resolution itself. And then you stop and start thinking about it and say, oh yeah, we need it. And we need to give the fight. And even if it's gonna be tough, we need to give the fight. So, okay, you put it there and then, you, you will get a lot of um, pushback from some countries, uh, uh, usually the, the usual suspects. So, uh, but, but we need to keep the fight. And so yes, it's gonna take a lot of work. Nobody says it, what, it's gonna be easy, but we need to do it. So just focus on that and, 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 and on the results. Uh, and even if at that part, some, at that point, sometimes it was annoying, I have to be honest, the, the most shocking experience I, I have uh, uh, that actually uh, set me in this mind of, oh, okay, yes, this is, there's a gender thing going on here, and I'm in the middle of it, was during the governmental group of experts uh, on nuclear verification, nuclear summer verification. And we were in the third session of it, and we were negotiating the, the final report of, of it. And the group was composed of uh, 23 male, two women, uh, Maria Argentina, uh, colleague, and myself. So, and two women from Latin America. So it was uh, the two of us just requesting in the beginning of, of the report, just to highlight the fact that uh, the composition of the group was not uh, gender balanced and that it was only two out of 25. Uh, representatives. And that was it. It was a factual point. We didn't, uh, uh, were, we, we were not requesting for any kind of assessment of, of if it was good bar or, or, or anything. Just the factual point that it was two out of 25. That's it. Okay, it took us around an hour to discuss that and guess what? It didn't pass. We did not manage to put that phrase in the, in the final report 
the final report did not reflect at this because of course uh, lots of the uh, of, of, of the mail there were not in favor particularly there were two of them and the rest of them were like oh no you know it's an issue for them to accept it so just let it go let it go it's not important and we're like come on i mean and i'm not talking about the usual suspects here i'm talking about western european countries who were telling us let it go so okay that was shocking and after that i had this uh, uh i went to the uh, third preparatory committee uh of the 10th review conference of the mpt in new york in 2019 and there was this uh side event on on gender perspective in, uh, in disarmament and it was uh i mean i was gonna take the floor and say it because isumi nakamitsu was just there and it was like this is my opportunity to go and and, and say this this cannot keep going and it was really uh, uh, an experience because in a way it was kind of a, a victim situation the one that i was thinking about and it should not be like that you know and it was uh when i mentioned what happened uh isumi nakamitsu replied to me and say this is a matter also of i, I mean is, is the, the, this is something that is is an evidence of, of a structural inequality this is not something just that is linked to disarmament or not this is something that is based in society and the way that we that that, that we work and it's also a matter of power men are used to have the power in this field and everything and they are not going to give it that easy so it's also a matter of if you want it you have to you have to earn it and you do have to fight for it because it's not going to be given for just as easy as, as it is. But uh, men, of course, are not, uh, you are not against them. You have to work in an alliance with them to try to change these uh, structural inequalities. And one of the things that we have to see is that every time you go to one of these side events on gender um, issues is like 95% is women, maybe 5% are men or maybe less, I don't know. And the thing is that we have to, to work and involve, and as, uh, as uh, Ambassador uh, Annika Thunberg was mentioning, this is a, a shared responsibility for men and women. We need to work together, we need to set the table and to, to actually show that we have a contribution to make. That's the only way that we can get there. The contribution that we have to make also is not just about uh, general perspectives also, but we have different, there's a diversity here that we have to recognize, different impacts on the weapons, or, I mean, the, the impact that a nuclear weapon has is different, biologically is different in a man and a woman. So the women's perspective have to be reflected in whatever decision is being taken around this issue. Uh, the way, let's say, I, I want to share with you actually, uh, if you can look it up, there's, there, there's a group of friends uh, for women in nuclear in Vienna. It was shared by, uh, by our previous Mexican ambassador in Vienna. And uh, she wrote this document that is uh, called Gender, COVID-19 and Women in Nuclear. And it actually, um, it actually in a way show how the pandemic uh, revealed that women are in the front lines of our society and our economies. Uh, women are essential workers, but and of course, uh, beside that, women also bear a great deal of responsibility for holding societies together, but we're not represented. So when, when policies uh, are developed, the problem is that women are not represented, but actually we are, we are in the front line and, and we know what's the deal there. We can contribute with our own experiences in order to make better policies and actually policies that are targeting the main issues because we know what the issue is and we have the own, uh, our own experiences in order to um, enhance the situation. So, um, I mean, we have seen it, we are not uh, represented properly in for us. It has changed, but it has changed um, not in a substantial way. Also, you can see, let's say, when I arrived in Geneva in 2012, I remember maybe it was about around, maybe we were like five, six uh, female experts, plus maybe two person um, per permanent representatives that were women in the Conference of Disarmament. Maybe when I left in 2018 Geneva, I could say that maybe from two, it was five or six um, 
uh, per, permanent representatives, which, okay, you will say is 300%, where still six out of 65 is not that much. And of course, you see uh, many more women as expert in, in the expert level, but not in the ambassadorial level. So that's also something that is happening. It's not just about the numbers. It's also about the position and the responsibility that you're having and the possibility to contribute in those positions. So I, I will leave it there. I will just uh, invite, of course, um, uh, our, our male colleagues to contribute to this and our female colleagues. Uh, yes, I will repeat what Isumi told me. It's not going to be easy, but it's our responsibility. And we bear a great responsibility also because we are in privileged situations. We are in a situation that we do have the possibility of uh, our voice being heard by others. Not all the women have that. So we have responsibility for all those women who cannot take the floor in these meetings. And, and, and we have to explain what the situation is. So please uh, become part of the solution and not of the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paola. Um, I think that the um, stories like this, uh, they are very powerful because they, they allow us to actually, you know, see um, the how somebody's career, you know, experiences uh, different uh, challenges and opportunities, through, you know, uh, throughout and depending also on the post where you are posted. It's very interesting observation. I think that um, your story is very compelling and uh, hopefully it will help uh, some young uh, people in this audience, you know, to uh, maybe face the challenges you faced and uh, address these challenges, especially I like when you said you're Mexico, you know, you are a representative of the country, uh, no matter, you know, what your gender is. And I think it, it's, it's very, um, I, I learned a lot. I mean, I wish I, um, I knew that when I was younger, <laughs> so I could actually deal with challenges like you did. And uh, now it's our last but not least speaker, uh, Professor uh, Rabia Saeed, who is, um, the associate professor at the atmospheric of physics uh, at the atmospheric physics in the department of physics at the Bayera uh, University in Kana, Nigeria. But currently, she is also a visiting fellow at our center, who is stuck in Monterey. <laughs> she cannot go back <laughs> to her home country <laughs> due to travel restrictions. And um, I will let Rabia talk, you know, about your background, but also if you were interested, you could look her up. She's in Wikipedia. So uh, uh, you could uh, see all her um, achievements there. And uh, Rabia, please uh, take the floor. And maybe if you keep your comments to 15 minutes or less, so we have some time for uh, Q&A. Um, so we have to be mindful of time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Margarita. And um, good morning, everyone. And um, to the participants of the summer school, uh, it's my pleasure to be able to speak to you today. Uh, so as quick as possible, I'm going to say a few words about my career path. Uh, I'm a professor of physics at uh, a university in northern Nigeria in a city called Kano, and uh, that university is Bayro University. Uh, I was employed as a graduate assistant in 1999, and since then I have been teaching undergraduate and postgraduate students teaching them physics courses, and also uh, supervision of um, postgraduate students in specific courses like atmospheric physics, space sciences, energy and environment, and uh, the climate change interface. Um, but my day job actually requires that I stick to the hard and technical aspect of science. Uh, but I have always been more interested in the impact on sci of science on society and how I can use my technical and scientific knowledge for the betterment of society. So when I am not teaching physics, I am advocating for women in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and training men, women and men to stand up for science. My interest took me to a search that led me to a master's degree in environment and development in my effort to bridge the gap between hard science and policy. It is this continuous search for women in STEM, and uh, it is this continuous search that led me to apply for the February 2019 intensive course uh, on non-proliferation and security for women in STEM, and which brought me in contact with CNS, and subsequently 
with the King's College Center for Security Studies when I attended another workshop in September 2019 uh, on nuclear security culture. Consequently, I got selected to participate in the CNS 2020 Spring Fellowship. And uh, here I am, I'm still here. I came out in uh, February of this year and uh, due to COVID-19, I have been stuck here waiting for a safe way to return home. So some challenges and opportunities I have had as a woman are a lot of challenges and also many opportunities. In the early days when my children were growing up, I have six children, by the way, uh, the challenge was balancing between the job and doing it well and also ensuring that the children get the attention they deserve. So that was quite, it was a, it was a challenging balancing act uh, I did it, I tried, and then uh, I think, I, I, think I, I, I succeeded somehow. I was lucky that we have a lot of extended family support. That, was, that helped a lot. And then for opportunities uh, for women, uh, whenever I look at opportunities for women, I see that since the Beijing Declaration in 1995, um, it is my opinion that women have gradually been finding their voices in some fields such as nuclear policy, nuclear security, perhaps maybe in those fields, baby steps, but opportunities have been accruing in all that we have been doing. Uh, so for me, I think there are those opportunities where women have been given chance to, to give uh, their, to, to speak their mind and to also contribute their voices uh, are increasing gradually. So how will an increased women representation change the discourse in nuclear non-proliferation, disarmament, peaceful uses of nuclear energy and nuclear security? Uh, in my opinion, we need this increased women representation. The world population statistics shows that the ratio of men to women is almost one to one. So for such a scenario, representation of women in all aspects that affect society is not debatable. The discourse in nuclear non-proliferation, disarmament, peaceful uses cannot be better projected than by women. They bear the brunt of the consequences. Their emotional vulnerabilities for children, the vulnerable in society, behoves that they have a say. So there is, is, there is no debate about the, 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 we need to be represented in all of this scenario. So what words would I give? Words of wisdom and advice uh, for both men and women who work in this field and who are beginning their career or early stages of their careers. So here I want to refer to something that was said in a webinar I participated in yesterday. Dr. Mona El Shokri from Egypt, one of the uh, fellows, CNS fellows, past CNS, uh, CNS fellows, mentioned that her team has 95% female and about 5% male. And then she jokingly said, we will soon chase away the 5%. I want to say here, let's not chase the men out. We need to work together. We now have gender champions, gender, uh, gender champions in nuclear policy, gender champions in nuclear security, gender champions in STEM, thanks to NTI and WCAPS, we have all these champions. What we need is the concept of what I bring from Africa, the concept of Ubuntu. Ubuntu is an African concept and it's one of my favorites. It is a concept that says, I am because you are. I am happy if you are happy. I am not secure if you are not. So we as female in nuclear policy, in nuclear security, in disarmament, in non-proliferation, in STEM, must ensure that we work together, men and women. Luckily, we are getting more and more men listening and working with us. We must sustain this. Let us do it together. 
that would be my word of advice and uh, the little contribution I give today. And then I can answer more uh, in, if there's any Q&A. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Said. Um, I like that, uh, you know, let us do it together. That's, I think, and uh, Paola and uh, Anika also mentioned that, you know, we have to do this. We have to be in this together, like we're in, together in the COVID pandemic. So it's, you know, we're all together. A um, couple of uh, comments before I open the floor. Uh, Rabia is also, she is uh, mentoring young girls and encouraging them to um, join science. Uh, so, you know, she didn't mention that, I think, uh, um, but uh, if you have any questions about that, you're welcome to um, ask you. And I also like uh, what Paola said about uh, the group disarmament ladies. And I started thinking, you know, there are all kinds of groups. There was Atomic Ladies. Uh, it's a group run by women at the Los Alamos National Lab. At the uh, conference, which is taking place this week, Inter uh, Institute for Nuclear uh, Material Management, they have a panel which they called Women of Mass Distinction. <laughs> and <laughs> Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, who is the founder of the um, uh, Women of uh, Color Advancing Peace and Security Organization, she was one of the speakers. So I like that Women of Mass Distinction. Maybe after that school, we'll, we'll come up with some other name for this group of uh, people, uh, you know, and women and men. So um, I think that uh, we, uh, we could uh, open the floor for the uh, discussion and uh, I have some questions. And Jean, did you want people to ask questions directly or do you want me to read them? Uh, no, Margarita, I think uh, we will typically allow people to ask the questions. Absolutely. Some of some folks, some participants may not have uh, access to the Mac microphones, and then we can you can just read the question. But I will tell you which ones those are. Yeah, there are four questions already. So, um, do, do you do you want people who ask them to speak, or so you yeah you can uh, you can ask any one of them to to speak, and I will. Okay, and they so can the go first ahead. the first question came from William Nicholas P Pierre. Um, I'm sorry, I mispronounced the last name. Uh, would you like to s answer your question, uh, uh, ask your question, or do you want me to read it? Yes, I, I will ask it. Please. Okay, thank please, you. thank you. And, and I prefer the time uh, to, to take our Mexican government for, for nice, of course, and I, I've learned so much so far. Thank you to Mr. Dupuis and also because he was very professional at his, at his work. And I took the time to ask the question to Mrs. Tom, Tom Bob, because as you were talking uh, uh, earlier, you said that uh, civilians should get more involved for fighting uh, nuclear nuclear issues. Uh, but uh, uh, you, you told that uh, they should be more involved. But how can people who have been victims of nuclear uh, nuclear conflicts? What's the better strategy to, to take to, to take to to fight against against this issue for CV in, in, in particular for CV then? Thank you very much. Do you want me to answer the question directly, uh, Margarita? Yes. yes, yes, please. I'm sorry. Or, or wait. Uh, yeah, I think I, I think yeah. we should. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or take me more, or more questions, uh, or, or no, it's up to you. I would probably take one question at a time right now, and then maybe we'll change okay. the dynamic later. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, very good. Well, thank you very much uh, for the question. I, I do believe that uh, many of the key agreements we have achieved in the nuclear field, uh, that the uh, uh, victim's perspective was taken into account. It was extremely important when we got the uh, partial test ban treaty in 1963, which of course uh, prohibited uh, atmospheric testing and also, uh, um, yeah, I mean, so, so which, which of course had a huge, uh, um, huge humanitarian consequences. So the victim's perspective there was very, very important. And uh, I, I also believe that, uh, I mean, the, the, the testimonies that we had from Hiroshima and Nagasaki were very important for the treaties we did, uh, did achieve uh, in, for example, the non Nuclear Non-Preparation Treaty and, uh, and others. So that perspective has always uh, been, been there. Uh, I don't think that we necessarily have had a gender perspective. I don't think that they necessarily thought about actually thinking about 
about uh, uh, you know uh, that that uh, maybe these uh, conflicts or the, that the the the, the uh, the women who were victims of uh, both the nuclear attack and uh, nuclear testing, that perhaps the consequences were slightly different. Uh, we did much better work in that field in, in the conventional arms field later on when we got the, got the uh, uh, treaty that prohibited uh, anti-personnel mines, for example, and, and other conventional uh, weapons agreement where we started to look at, okay, uh, maybe the effects on women are different uh, because uh, the, the the social position of women have been different. Uh, so then you start to look at this. But I think there is much more we can do in that uh, in that field, and um, uh, not a lot of research is going on. Also, if there are, for example, different consequences uh, um, when it comes to women's health and so on uh, from from uh, from uh, nuclear uh, fallout, and, and of course the whole debate uh, about. Uh, nuclear accidents, uh, which is, is part of the nuclear energy as well, which of course is a very important perspective. We know this, that medical science go uh, move, move forward on these uh, issues uh, that, uh, for example, we know nowadays, and this is very recent, that uh, um, women have different heart attacks than, women, than men, for example. We thought for a long time that, uh, that mainly men got heart attacks, but now we know that as many women got heart, get heart attacks, but they just have different symptoms. So these are the things that, it, why it is important with the gender perspective because the consequences are not always always the same and I think we can do much more there um, I think that that is the uh, uh, um, the answer I have on, 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 on that question at this point thank you thank you I wonder if any of the panelists want to say if, you know if you have any specific comments to that particular question which was addressed to uh, Annika okay okay uh, so uh, the next um, person to ask a question is Melissa Viola. Uh, Melissa, are you on the line? Hi, it's can you hear me? It's a great question. Yes. Uh. Good morning. I'm Melissa from Argentina. Uh, I would like to thank you for all the presentations. I really enjoyed this. Uh, and my question is this. Even though I share the view that it is not us against them, currently most strategic decision-making positions are held by men. And I don't think that they are willing to resign their privileges. I mean, I see it day after day in my work uh, workplace. So I was wonder, wondering how do we women break this dynamic and try to position ourselves to pair up? That is uh, my question. And what would you suggest for us? Thank you very much. Well, that's a great question. Uh, so who wants to go first? Thank you, Melissa. I can do it. If Please. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there's only one, one way to do it. I mean, in my personal opinion, and it's work, work, work hard, be extraordinary. Uh, show what you can do, inspire others. That's the only way that you can do it. As you say, they are not going to leave their positions by themselves. So we have to take them, but we have to take them in, in, a, fair, in a fair way and take it like that. It's not about quotas or not quotas. Show that you actually earn the position. And as I mentioned before, it's not going to be easy. It's not easy, but it's the only way to do it. And one thing that I will recommend in this way, because uh, uh, is, 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 well, two things, I think. One will be don't take things personal in, in, throughout the career. Don't take things personal also as a, as a woman or not, because we are talking here about issues of power, of social and cultural expectations that will not change from one day to another. So sometimes people will react with this context or this baggage behind themselves, but it's not against you, against you in a personal way. I mean, you have to break with these with these schemes and everything. So so just uh, you have to to develop a really thick scheme and and keep going. I mean I think that will be my 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 first um, my first uh, recommendation and, and and the second one I think one is of the most important ones that I have learned throughout my career is just enjoy the ride while you are doing this and everything. Just enjoy it. Uh, if you see something that is really difficult, don't take it as an obstacle. Take it as a challenge challenge yourself and say, I have done things before I can do this. Uh, that's why I, I mentioned before why self-confidence is so important is this. Nobody is gonna fight your battles. So just get strong and get ready and, and enjoy it. I think, I think that that will be it. Thank you. I think uh, uh, Ambassador Thunberg raised their hand. 
to say a few words. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. I think it is a combination of, of factors and uh, looking back at uh, the experiences we have had in, in the Nordic uh, uh, country and just to also to say to, to Paula that it's not so that all Western countries are very good at gender equality. I mean, I have lived in continental Europe and, and also some countries have very conservative family policies, for example, which basically makes it very difficult for women to get out in the workplace. So in some countries, the diplomatic core is very dominated by, by men in, in also in, in, in Western European countries. Uh, and the, uh, I think it is a combination of, of, of factors. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the women's solidarity is important. Uh, I can mention an example. For example, I, I did my PhD at uh, the University of Lund and the University of Columbia in, in, in New York. Uh, Columbia was actually much more equal, uh, much more, more women involved than it was at the University of Lund in Sweden, which may be a surprise to you. I, became, I was hired as a research assistant in uh, 1987. And uh, at that point, uh, you didn't have a single uh, woman who had uh, finished her doctorate at the University of Lund in Sweden. We had more than 50 male professors on the faculty. And this was political science. We're not talking about natural sciences, but actually in the social sciences. Because the, the, uh, the head of uh, the dean of the of the faculty, uh, he didn't think that women could do political science. Huh? His wife was actually a professor of sociology, so sociology apparently was something that women could do, but political science, politics, no. <laughs> and we got, but we got a new dean, and he said, "Go, okay, this is this is crazy. We need to have more women." So he actually he 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 recruited four of us at the same time as research assistants because he also understood that if you only recruit one woman, that woman will leave because. You, <laughs> How are you going to make it in the male world? He recruited four, and it was not difficult because in the, uh, at the undergraduate level we were a lot of women. So uh, here we moved into a very male-dominated world, and a lot of the men, uh, profess male professors, they had no idea. They usually got quiet when you got into the uh, coffee room because they didn't know how to talk to a professional woman. And uh, so, so what was important in that situation? Well, it was important with the male supporters, as I said again, you know, to have allies among the men, men who actually would like to change uh, uh, things. And I think that there, there we have done well in Sweden, and not always. There have been a lot of men that have been against uh, uh, more women in different fields, but you have had male allies. You need to pick those and work with those, and though they need to show the way or as well uh, among other men. I mean, that is also, we have a military, we have a commander in chief now who is really extremely, I mean, I listened to his summer program on Swedish radio, and you know, he only talks about how important it is to recruit more women and diversity in general into the armed force is extremely important important with these leadership mod models. But then the female solidarity, you know, we here in Mexico as well, we are only uh, 10, uh, we are around, we are always around 10 female ambassadors among 90, among many Arby Paula, 95 altogether in Mexico, and this, it never changes. But this actually small group of 10 female ambassadors, we, ha we are very uh, close, closely connected. We, we do a lot of things together. And um, and uh, we can also, there's also advantages because through our uh, dinners and lunches, we, 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 we are able to, to get almost every uh, female uh, important decision maker in Mexico to have lunch or breakfast with us. So we have a very unique platform because of that. So that solidarity is extremely important and support we give to, uh, to each other uh, throughout your career. And then I think it is important, and of course I, I can also to, to um, I mean, the political reforms, as I said, institutions, reforms, step by step, you need to put all these pieces in place to change a society. Uh, and this will take time. So I'm sorry to say it, it doesn't go overnight. Uh, um, it gets easier with position and with age, I can say as well. It's much easier for me now than it was when I was 25. And um, um, I will say one thing that I do that has uh, that has always uh, happened to me during my career 
it is that you uh, often as a woman they actually call you by first name uh, they don't use i mean they don't call you doctor they don't don't call you ambassador in my case they call me annika and that's of course okay i mean we do that here if you do that with everyone but i have been in settings and i can mention paula sorry to mention mexico but that's my last uh, uh, that, that is my latest experience you know i've been in tv interviews with other male colleagues so we are a group of ambassadors maybe four in an interview at at, at, a, at a TV station and then they call me Annika and they call the others ambassador and uh, uh, what I have done in those situations of course you can't say anything in, in the actual um, scene you know if it's a live uh, uh, broadcast but I do take the journalist uh, aside afterwards and I say oh, please so you know I don't know if you were aware of this but to say it very nicely and and actually it has happened to me with two famous journalists in Mexico and both were extremely embarrassed afterwards they hadn't thought about this they hadn't thought about that they actually had um, treated me differently uh, and uh, and they apologized profusely and and then I saw a change uh, it didn't happen again and again this with male colleagues uh, my one of my male ambassadors uh, friends he actually said that to a journalist as well in a, in a break uh, in a, it, we had a break during the live broadcast and he said um, you know either you call all of us ambassador or you call all of us by first name but you don't distinguish um, so that is again important with the female solidarity with the uh, with male allies and with actually always as, as soon as something happens try to correct it immediately talk to the person communicate with the person who has done something and do it in a nice and and, and polite way and usually they feel extremely embarrassed I mean most of them would because they haven't thought about it and this way we also change uh, things uh, uh, little by little thank you thank you very much uh Rabia, if you have a couple of, yeah. do, do, would you share your view? Yeah, just something uh, that I want to say is that uh, as women, in order to be able to uh, to fit in and also join the mail and sit at the table with men, we have to work hard. We should not take it for granted that um, we can just, because we are women, then we can have it. We have to know our stuff, be able to, you know, be able to hold our place in any discussion. And um, I attended a program once and the lady was saying uh, for women, in order to be able to make impact, we probably need to work twice as hard as men. But then she now ended it by saying, fortunately, this is not difficult. So we need this mindset that we have to work twice as hard but then we should put the mindset that it is not difficult. We can do it. So I think that's one way. Those are ways in which we can uh, be able to join our male counterparts and be uh, at the top level of this decision with them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we have a, a few questions, so I will just go straight to the questions. Uh, the next um, question comes from Erica Campos. Uh, Erica, would you like to take a microphone? Hold on, uh, just a minute. I she disappeared off the. Uh, okay, I, I could read your question if if you think. Yeah, hold on, hold on. I there you go. Erica, go ahead. Okay, do you hear me? Yep. No. Oh, nice. Uh, well, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Erica Campos. I speak from Brazil, and well, first of all, I must say that. This was a very inspir inspirational and instructive session. I'm really impressed with you all. And my question is, uh, my question is, do you think that the involvement of more women in debates about disarmament and non-proliferation has the potential to actually change the perspective of where strategic interests really lie? in the sense that this could shift security perspectives from deterrence towards the prioritization of human security. Thank you. Who would like to, who would like to take this? Um, who would be? Any? So, um, I can take it again just to start with it. Uh, mm -hmm. with my colleague, yes. uh, you know, uh, th there are actually some um, 
there's a lot of, of, of uh, uh, articles written on this, I have to be honest. Uh, I will invite you also to, to, to go through this literature because it's really interesting. Some of it is from uh, Reaching Critical Will, uh, Will, uh, there's also from Article 36. There are many, many um, uh, NGOs which actually uh, work through this and, and it's really interesting to see different perspectives, which actually, what they mention is two things. One, let's say in nuclear, nuclear disarmament, they actually relate the nuclear weapon with a symbol of masculinity and, and and it's really interesting to see in which way it's seen and 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 the way that uh, uh, this kind of masculinity permeates the whole uh, security context in a way the way that you deal with it uh, is, is different when you do it as a as a man than a woman that's what what some of these articles in a way uh, proves is is not just, I mean, they, they, they have different uh, arguments around, uh, around why it, it happens that way. Uh, the, the thing also about this is, is about if having the perspective changes in the way that you are uh, including another element, another, another view, another perspective. So it's, it's not that it might change drastically or not, but it might take into account other factors that were overseen before and that must be taken into consideration uh, through the development of, of, of policies. So I think that that will be the, 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 the main part of it. Now, it's not just about including um, women, as, it, as it's mentioned. This has, I mean, we have to tackle this uh, is, is, is intrinsically from, from, from its root. Uh, it was mentioned before about this, uh, the, the importance of, of, of the involvement of men. And here is, is also about, uh, I mean, I like what, what, what um, it was mentioned before in terms of uh, also it's a challenge for men to, to play other roles because of course they also have other so their so, social expectations about men being the provider men being you know yeah the the, the uh, I, I mean the soldier men be, so it's not just women it's, it's it's men also so it's also an invitation in a in, in a way to uh, from both sides seeing which are those uh, social frameworks in which we are moving which are acceptable or not. I mean, we have to question them and, and, and to see which way we can contribute to change it for a more um, equitable uh, society. Uh, I think I will took, uh, we'll touch upon those aspects in, in, in other questions, but, but I, I will leave it there, but I think those, those will be the aspects that, that I would like to comment. Margarita, you're muted, sorry. Uh, yeah. Any other immediate comments? We have uh, a lot of questions pouring in, so we want to make sure everybody has a chance to ask their question. So if you don't have immediate comments uh, to that, no, no. So um, what Jean suggested, and I think it's a good approach, is that we take the first three, the next three questions and let people ask these questions and then we'll decide who will take these questions. Is it okay? Okay, so. So um, I have next in line, uh, which is a very, um, imp let's see, uh, Pablo. Uh, Pablo, would you like to ask your question? And then I have Kimberly and uh, um, G G Gamaliel uh, Munoz. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, my apologies. Hello, uh, thank you very much for this uh, amazing, uh, uh, um, this amazing conversation that we are having today. Uh, uh, I, my question is if you can provide us some comments about the importance to promote the uh, new masculinity approaches. Uh, and I want just to, to make this point because uh, Ambassador Thunberg uh, uh, talked about it and I think that is very important. Uh, uh, and I think the, the, it's important to to know uh, the, the importance to promote new masculinity approaching or daily work as a diplomat uh, beyond the cultural aspects. And I think that new masculinity approaches that include uh, obviously gender equality, finalized with the gender pay gap, uh, equal opportunities for everyone, but even the respect of, of uh, 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 sexual orientation and the LGBT community. Uh, because usually in our work as diplomats, we promote gender equality at the multilateral level, but it is, it is important also in our work environment. Uh, um, uh, in my case, uh, I am from Costa Rica. My name is Pablo Eniken. I am a young diplomat. And sometimes 
uh, as a young diplomat, uh, I can feel that even the people uh, don't pay me the, the attention that <laughs> as a diplomat, you know? And I think that the, the situation increased if you are a, 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 a women young diplomat, because sometimes, and I remember at the FAO, and I just starting uh, my position here, that uh, sometimes the, the people uh, told me, ah, but you're a, uh, um, um, you are a, a, like a, 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 a fellow or are you a diplomat or something like that. So I think this, this is a, a very important point and I want to, to, to listen some comments from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. So we'll, we'll go through the, so the next question is Kimberly Gonzalez and may I please ask speaker just to limit to your question and if you have uh, some other notes uh, to say or some comments you could put them in the chat so let's let's try to do that for the sake of time kimberly please are uh, you unmuted you have to unmute yourself okay while we have um kimberly uh unmuting herself i i need to read this question which a person cannot ask directly because uh, he has no microphone um I just want to comment the importance of the language when trying to get a strong gender commitment, not just in our country, Mexico, but also worldwide. Therefore, I would like to thank Ambassador Thornburg for choosing the word share when talking about responsibilities that every family has to comply in a daily basis. Um, an adequate use of language would set a strong example for all the family members and that will be taken to workplaces as well. So that's... Uh, uh, Kimberly, uh, are you? Uh, so I guess I will ask, read Kimberly's question. Um, thank you, panelists, for your perspective and experiences. I would appreciate the moderator to pose this question to Professor Said. Um, I've heard that I've heard it said that the greatest predictor of a woman's professional achievement is the support of her spouse. I hope the changes one that changes one day, however, in your mentioning of young women in your field. Is it your experience that their fathers or spouses are willing to contribute positively to their professional advancement? Also, are there any actions uh, you take to encourage them to come on board with their f for their education? So these two questions are sort of similar, and there's also how do we, do, how do we uh, look at the masculine approaches? So uh, can we just very quickly try to answer? We have five minutes left. So please, whoever wants to go, and take whatever question you want. Uh, you're all muted. Okay, I don't know if I can take mine. Yes. The one that okay. is directed mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, this question is actually really, really relevant to me because um, coming from Nigeria and Africa, it is really true that um, the the greatest predictor of a woman's professional achievement is the support of her spouse. This is so true, and um, it, we try in in my um, in my group what we do in mentoring the young girls. We try as much as we can. If there are young women who are still at home, we try as much as we can to engage the parents as well, so that they would be able to support the uh, the young girls. I remember one time I was in a high school where it's, it's called secondary school in my country. And they were final year um, uh, high school students who were going to graduate and go to university. So I spoke to them about their career and uh, the, uh, the things, how they can go into science and all the other professions and so on. And at the end of the talk, one of the girls came to me and she said, will it be possible for you to organize another session where we bring in our parents and then you can say the same thing that you said? Because for me, um, I, I align with whatever you have said. But I have this problem. It may not be likely that my parents will allow me because I think they want me to just finish high school and then get married. So the only way to actually change mindset, in my opinion, is that we, we keep on um, encouraging uh, the girls and at the same time uh, involving their parents and trying to change their mindset. And this is what we are doing. This is what I'm trying to do to contribute uh, positively to the, the professional advancement of these girls and to see how we can continue to bring the, the parents um, on board. And if they are married, 
We also include the spouses in any of the career development or workshops that we do. We try to include the, the spouses so that they are there and then they listen. And so we're trying to encourage them. Then they become uh, our gender champions and then help us to work towards what we want to achieve. Uh, I will leave it at that. Thank you. I, I wonder if somebody wants to take a Pablo's question, but we literally have like two minutes uh, if you want to. Yes, please. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can say a couple of words about uh, uh, new masculinities. Uh, it is actually something we focus a lot on 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 uh, now, and I'm sure some of these examples can be replicated in the uh, um, diplomatic world or in the in, in, in disarmament and, and, and non-proliferation world as well. Um, for example. Uh, we have worked a lot with, with uh, uh, here in Mexico, we have worked a lot with uh, uh, different institutions uh, 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 and had, we had a, had a photo exhibition uh, which about fathers and their children. And uh, there is a, a great photographer in Sweden that has done this, this interesting photo exhibition with fathers with their children uh, in Sweden. And then we also have had competitions in Mexico where uh, fathers of families can send in uh, photos uh, of the fathers with their children. And uh, this has then been shown all over uh, the country. And, and this has been with a lot of seminars and, and discussions about the role of fathers and, 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 and in, 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 in relation to their children. And this has uh, been very interesting because I think the difference we have seen with the, with the Swedish photographs is very, very much that the fathers are very much involved. Uh, you know, they, they, they do everything with their children uh, uh, because they actually are the caretaker of the children uh, when they are the only one at home with their child um, and the mother is not there. With, with many of the Mexican uh, photos, it was much more that the fathers being very loving with their children, but usually doing fun things, you know, being at the uh, at a Tivoli or, or, or going to a restaurant and so on. So, so this actually created very interesting debates. You know, what, what does it mean to be a father? And, and how, how is your relationship with your child? So this is one thing. We also have had an exhibition called Images That Changed the World. It's a, it's, it's the, it's, it's a male a, a photographer in Sweden called the Gender Photographer. And he actually is brought in to look at how different uh, organizations or companies or uh, governments uh, uh, how they present gender in, for example, their advertisement campaigns and so on. And we have done this in Sweden and, and you have absolutely hilarious examples how, how you show um, how men and women are portrayed and, 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 and where you, what you mentioned as well. Um, Pablo, the uh, uh, you know uh, in, in terms of of, of uh, the diversity in society and the LGBT community and and how how many are sort of absent from many of these campaigns. Of course, our view is very much that we uh, you can you you're more successful if if, if an organization or a company. Or a diplomatic corps can mirror uh, the uh, society that we that we have. I mean, the uh, that that is a de is a democratic mirror, democratic reflection of the society we live in, and otherwise it's not representative. So it's up to all of us to to see how we can make everything more representative. Uh, another project just on new masculinity that we have worked a lot on, lot on in Sweden, it is that we focus uh, since, uh, you know, for example, with more, more sexual violence, uh, violence against girls in schools, uh, um, also uh, new new issues that have come up, for example, child marriages or, or um, other treatment of uh, female circumcision and and, this, and and because we have a very multicultural society as well. I mean, we have a lot of projects that focus on the boys in school, the fathers, the brothers, the uncles, the male. Uh, so so don't, don't focus on the women, uh, focus on the men and have a discussion, you know, workshops with, 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 with men and, and, uh, and to discuss what to, what does this mean to we, me, to, to you, and how can we do this better, and so on? So I think that a uh, uh, little bit more of a focus on, you know, focus, go, go from the focus on women to go to the focus on men, um, and, uh, and 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 talk to different groups of of, of men in different uh, uh, situations. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. I stop there. We are running out of time, and there is one comment which was put in the Q and A, and I think I have to read it. Uh, it's from uh, Mr. Alexandro, and he also sh uh, shared some. Um, it says that he, 
how much he enjoys today's presentation, including particularly that of Ms. Paola Ramirez right now. The extraordinary learning curve of a Mexican professional diplomat from the perspective of a woman. Thank you very much for sharing those beautiful experiences which resonate in my own experience and probably those of, and it's cut off, I, those of, um, um, oh my gosh, I lost it. Those of um, I, other I colleagues, particularly women in a variety of ways. I think on this note, we uh, unfortunately have to um, wrap up and I'm giving the floor to Jean. Well, thank you very much. Um, I apologize that you have to wrap up, but I, I, I would like to add um, a, a few perspectives of my own, if I may. Um, I think the, the point here that I, that I picked up, which is so important, Anna could just mention it as, again, is that it is not the responsibility of women. Um, we often, to, and, and, and this panel, um, I didn't want to make the panel too large, and it's a panel of only women, but it's not an issue for women. It's an issue for, and, and all of you have said this, um, and, and I like the, uh, what Rabi have said, and I think this is a brilliant idea. If, if, you're, gonna, if you're gonna train people, you, you, you bring the men with to, to, to that understanding. Um, you know, I, my experience as a, as a, as a diplomat, um, we all get uprooted from our, you know, convenient areas that we live in, and then we move on to our next post, right? And as the active diplomat, then you have the, the convenience of the office and they make things easy for you. But the spouse, in most cases, especially in South Africa years ago, um, the spouse was the woman. And the spouse had to give up her career every time, every time. So my wife, who is an American, um, when we um, you know, first met, we met in Washington. She, had, she was a high-powered lobbyist um, in, in Washington. And I had to move her to, to Pretoria. Um, and she became, she became, she took a, a, a really nice job at the United States Agency for Development. And then I had to move her back to New York. And she took a really nice job at the, at the um, children's television uh, workshop, uh, the producers of Sesame Street. And guess what happened? We had to move again. Um, it finally dawned upon me when I moved back from, from uh, Vienna here, is that I'm moving with her. Um, and so, you know, it, it was, uh, it's really important to, un to, to, to understand as diplomats that as your careers progress, you're going to be uprooting your family. And especially um, if you are a male with your, your partner that may not be able to work. Situations have changed, but Annika, I'm sure you would agree in, in, in your career as a diplomat, um, Sweden might be different, but Often it was frowned upon for the diplomat's spouse. In most cases, the diplomat was a male for the spouse to be working. Um, and and that, that, I mean, the spouse must do the spousal things. You know, it's the entertainment, it's the, you know, be there to, to smile at the right time and so on. These are old fashioned ways, but it's still stuck in the minds of many, and you know, I think I'm struck, Annika, by by the comments that you made, and I've seen that too. I've seen it with, I've seen it, witness it in Vienna with you, um, where where people in the same group, men will be treated differently, um, and and so, and I I, I do think that um, the the concept of, well, let me rephrase that. The recent um, uprising again of, of racism in the United States and, and all over the world has brought an introspective view, um, I think, of many in this country. And there was a, there's another message that came out of this, is that you cannot ask uh, people of color and black people to say, 
what should we do to change things? You should know, right? And the same way that I want to say, you should not ask women as a man, what you what should you do to help you? And I, I really, Annika, you started this in, in the beginning. Is, this is not an issue of help, right? We should not be asking that. We should, and, and, uh, and Paula, I think you also said it, we should step aside. We should create the opportunities for for everyone. Um, and and uh, I would lo end this by saying that in our field of non-proliferation, despite what Annika has said, um, the very first president of the very first review conference of the NPT um, was Amb Ambassador Inga Thorsen. Um, I, I, when I give my talks on the NPT, I always talk about the Iron Lady Conference. Um, and that, that ambassador was, was tough. Um, she made sure that the NPT actually survived before it was killed because it was the very first review conference. And, and I think there's an example of way back in the 70s, of a, of a prominent woman leader uh, in, in our field. And there are many, many more, and we see them on the screen now. But um, I, I really like to thank you for, for an amazing panel. It, it served to uh, really uh, end this course on an extremely high note, very positive note. Um, and I wish you all well, and I wish all the, uh, the diplomats that are with us, um, especially the women diplomats, um, you know, all the best. And, you know, as, as Paula said, enjoy it because, um, and, and I will end with, with Ubuntu. Um, that's, that's how we all feel. If, if you enjoy it, I enjoy it. So thank you so much. We're going to,